Um, good afternoon. My name is James Holzbauer, and um, I know a lot of you from a long time ago. And um, I'm the assessment and referrals coordinator for female applicants to the Adult Protective Service Worker Program in the City of Toronto. It's quite a mouthful. And this is my friend John Devinish. Obviously, fans of jazz. I guess. And John is the um, assessment and referrals coordinator for male applicants to the Adult Protective Service Program. But what some people don't know is that John and I have known each other for, I mean, we go way back, way, way back. We were actually co joined twins, separated at birth. <laughs> he got all the melatonin, I got all the testosterone. Yeah. Never, never. So we're, we're here today to talk about um, human rights. And does anybody know, I know that um, when your manager put out the, uh, the email, she gave you a definition of me. Some people say men, but uh, stick with me. Does anybody know what meme means? Yeah, okay. A meme is um, a set of ideas that are all sort of um, organized around one, one principle, okay? So I think um, memes are not thoughts that you have, but meme, memes are ideas, ways of thinking about things, okay? So John's going to read to us a definition of meme, because he has a voice like melted butter. Like melted meme. <laughs> so a meme is a unit of cultural ideas, symbols or practices which can be transmitted from one mind to another through writing, speech, gestures, rituals, or immutable phenomena. Supporters of the concept regard memes as cultural analogs to genes in that they self-replicate and respond to selective pressures. So a meme is kind of like sets of genes. We all know now that one gene doesn't really do much in the genome. That it takes two or three or five or eight or ten genes all to work together to create something like, say, a disease or, or schizophrenia. So we won't find one gene that causes schizophrenia, but we found a section of genes that all relate to one another. They turn, one turns the other on, and at the end of it, you get something. So memes are like that. They're connected ideas all organized around one grand principle. And if you're still struggling with what a meme is, I'd like you to think about the world's religion. Religion is a grand meme, okay? It's a set of ideas, a way of thinking about things that are, that existential issues like why am I here, what am I doing, is there life after death, and is there a God, and if so, did she write a book, and can I know her? All of those things, are those questions are answered under a grand meme called a world religion. So today we're here to talk about the grand meme of human rights. Because human rights, as an idea, as a set of ideas, as a way of thinking about our existence, has not always been here. It was only a couple of hundred years ago when I could have owned John. It was only maybe a hundred years ago where women were told by their government and their, and, their, and their religions often that they didn't have souls. They couldn't vote, you couldn't vote. You didn't, you didn't have the right to your own body. You were owned by someone. But you know, in, in, many, in many cultures prior to ours when we started thinking about human rights, a woman was owned by her husband. And, her ch and their children were owned by him. And he could kill her, or he could kill his own children, and there would be no penalty for that whatsoever, because they weren't people. They didn't have souls. They were property. So the idea of human rights, this great grand meme, this great way of thinking about our existence, is very, very new. And um, we're going we're gonna to look today at a number of rights movements and um, what, what, in various stages of actualization, some of them have happened, and some are in the process of happening, and, and some are enshrined in law, and some aren't yet. And then we're going to look at what that means for us in the work that, that we do. One thing that we know about memes is that they're contagious. So I want you to think about that, just like um, certain great ideas can pass from one person to another. But the idea of human rights, and every human having rights, is something that's contagious. And the more that I believe it, and the more that I talk about it, and the more that I, I go out and do things like this, and the more that you do that, the more people then will come on board with the, the grand meme of human rights. So we know memes are contagious. They pass from one person to another. Rights are cultural ideas that come and go. Rights are not static. Um, they are culturally determined. One of the 
does that mean? That means that in some cultures, some rights are honored and respected and protected, and in other cultures, those same rights aren't as yet. I think we, uh, we, we know a little bit about that in the news today. There's a woman, um, and uh, she has been, um, I don't know if you heard about this, she's been put in prison because she was raped. Raped? Yeah. And she was put in prison because she didn't prevent it. She didn't report it soon enough. But even though she knew that if she reported it, she could end up in prison. So there's the, you know, how, how, how quickly would you report something as a victim of a crime if you knew you were the one going to end up in prison? So rights are not universal, they are culturally determined. That's why in Canada we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and in the United States they have the Bill of Rights. Two very similar countries, cousins living side by side, and yet we have different ideas about how those rights are to be enshrined. For instance, in the United States, as a gay man, I could be fired from my job, I can be denied an apartment, I can be refused a loan or a mortgage, and that's perfectly legal. In Canada, that's not. So we have different ideas about whose rights should be protected and respected and honored, even with our American cousins and our friends. So one thing we also know about rights, you don't get your rights without a fight. Am I right? No. Nobody, because the people that are in power are not particularly concerned about your rights. <laughs> They're concerned about their privilege and their power. That's what concerns them. So we know a couple of things about memes. They're contagious, they can spread from person to person, and you never get your rights without a fight. People in this room, because I'm looking out at this room and I'm seeing an enormous amount of diversity and that's fantastic. Every single one of us in this room at one point of time or another had to fight for our rights, to be treated equally with, it, with everybody else around us. So I'm going to play a little game with you guys, which is kind of fun, and I just want people to yell out, you know, the answer, whatever they think it is, okay? I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you to name that, what that picture represents, what right struggle that picture represents, okay? Martin Luther King. Slavery, Martin Luther King. What's the right struggle, though? Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights. Okay, so we have a number of names for that, civil rights and anti-racism, right? So the next one. Come on, girls rule the world. <laughs> what? <laughs> the feminist movement, equal rights for who? For women. Women. Yes. What? What? Religious rights. Religious rights. Yeah, religious rights. Right. 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 There we have symbols from all the major world religions, right? These are religious rights. Okay, you better get this one or I'm not going to get it. Oh, you guys are letting me down. <laughs> oh, oh somebody, somebody's working on it. Questioning. Queer questioning. Okay, just because I'm up there about six times, I know them all. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, two-spirited, and the new one is a... The new one is A, it's for allies. So all of you who stand with all of us who are represented here are now up there whether you like it or not with all of us. <laughs> what about this one? Body. Abortion rights, yes. Yeah. A woman's right to choose, yeah. Go ahead. Animal rights. Let's hear it from the vegetarian. A cow. Children's rights. Children's rights. Remember, you know, back 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and it's still in many, many countries, children don't have rights. I mean, we had children dying of black lung in, uh, in, in factories and in, and in uh, coal mines. And in much of the world, we still we still have problems with this. Child slave labor, right? So don't shop at the gap. Okay. Accessibility or disability walker. rights is another way, uh, another way to look at that. A walker. Okay, here's a tough one. 
Okay, show us John. Indigenous people's rights. Yeah. Well, we're here from the Philippines, and I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. People's rights. You know, there's a lot of places in the world where indigenous people have been living in the mountains or in a certain area for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And a government comes along and says, Do you have a title for the land? You don't have a title for the land? Oh, well, we're selling it to a mining corporation. Think about Brazil. Get out. Brazil. All over the world, this is happening. Do you know that in Bolivia, Evo, Evo Morales has now passed a, a law saying that um, it's enshrined in the Constitution that um, no one can do business if it hurts Mother Earth. That's, that's enshrined in the Constitution now, that Mother Earth has rights and that nothing can be done that will violate our ability to have a sustainable home. So this is, this is part of the struggle for indigenous people's rights or aboriginal people's rights. They've been there forever. And because some Johnny-come-lately government says you don't have a title, well, a title. What does a title mean to people who've lived there for 10,000 years? So indigenous peoples or aboriginal people. Yeah. Oh, he gave it away. John. <laughs> Vanna White is not doing her job. Somebody gave me a bottle of water earlier. Trans people's rights. Okay. Every human being has rights. Rights. But what does that mean? What do we have the right for? Is it we have the right to be treated equally with everybody else. We have the right to have the same access to everything that everybody else has. That's what we're talking about when we talk about human rights. And what does this mean? One of the things that we talk about in, in rights is the development of human rights, the way that this idea, this grand meme is growing and changing all the time. And, you know, we're going to talk about maybe some of the things that you think we might or should have rights to. We've talked about struggles that are in the process. What else do we, should we have the right to? Rights are a fight for a more just world. So if you want to think about what rights are, rights are a fight for what's right, yeah. what's equitable, and what's fair. And that, that idea, that meme, is added to and changed all the time. Do you think that we should all have the right to the necessities of life? No. Do we all have the right to food? Poor yeah. people. Yeah. Do you think every human being should have the right to uh. eat? Should we have the right to fresh potable water? Yes. And again, I'll, I'll point out that in many of the world's major cities, Manila being one, um, all through South America, what's happening is the government is selling the water rights to multinational corporations, and they then own the water that is absolutely necessary for all of us to sustain our lives. Then if you can't pay for the water, you don't get it. There's even been talk by our present mayor about privatizing water. After garbage will come water. There's, there's been talk on the federal government by our prime minister about selling water to the United States, putting that in the free trade agreement, allowing them to hook up pipes to the, the Great Lakes and ship it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah to uh, Nevada or wherever else they want to have uh, swimming pools and, and farms in the desert. Should we have the right to water? Should we have the right to adequate health care? Yes. They're fighting for that down in the United States right now, and we're fighting to keep it. <laughs> they're fighting to get it, and we're fighting to keep it. What about more ethereal things, things that aren't so tangible, the things that you can't reach out and touch? Should we have the right as the human race to live in peace? Yes. I'm looking out at this room, and all of us seem to manage to live in peace to some degree or another. I look out at my city, a city that I love, and I see people from all over the world, every every shade of the continuum. And we seem to we seem to do all right, be all right. We seem to do okay. Why is it that the world can't be like that? Why don't we as human beings have the right to live in peace when that's what all of us want anyway? Why do we allow governments in our names and corporations in our name to divide us? 
and to create war and to kill us? Why do we allow them to dismiss our lives so easily for their own greedy purposes? That's a fight that we've got to have. We've got to have a fight to live in a world of peace. Do we have the right to justice? Do we have the right to know that when we go into a court of law, we, we can be equally represented by a competent lawyer to state our case? Absolutely. There's a lot of people in the world that don't have the right to justice. Some of them might be in this room. Do we have the right to a sustainable home? Do we have the right, like Evo Morales said, when he, when he was the first indigenous man ever voted into the presidency of any South American or Central American country. And he took Mother Earth, an indigenous spiritual reality, and embedded it in the laws of the land and said nothing can happen in this country anymore that can be legal if it destroys our home. That's a right struggle that we can bring to Canada. That's a right struggle that, you know, when uh, old mining companies go up in north and uh, set up business and destroy the land right underneath our indigenous people who are living in abject poverty, 15 and 18 and 20 of them in run-down houses without plumbing, without running water, resorting to substance abuse and suicide, while the gold corporation right next door wreaks profits on raping the land. That's something we can bring to Canada from no. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about some established rights and we talked about some desired rights. What, do you, what else do you think we should have the right to? And the last time I did this presentation, somebody took me aside and said, you know, you're missing some things there. We need to have the right to live and to die in the way that we want. And that's, that's a very hot topic right now in, in the news. The Supreme Court has just ruled on that or is going to soon. Whether someone who is in chronic physical pain, who knows they're going to die in a terrible, painful death, whether they have the right to seek a physician that can help them. End their life in a peaceful way. I can pray. We can argue about that, we can discuss it, but it's just out there. It's something else that some people think we should have the right to. Now we've talked about all these things and it's great and you know, isn't it wonderful and that's terrific, but the interesting thing about rights is we all have universal human needs that are based on our rights, things that we want. All of us want control, right? We all want to be able to live and have our say in our lives, right? But we all want that control and those rights to do very different things. So universal rights have individual expression. And that's where we get into a little bit of a, of a real conundrum, a real, sometimes a conflict and a question. So what we say, our rights are universal in desire and they are individual in expression. We all want to have control and self-determination, but we all want that control and self-determination to do different things. On the macro level, on the, on the bigger level, um, we talk about universal rights, it's very clear, but on the micro level, down here on the ground, individual expression of those rights gets a little messy. So this makes the discussion of individual expression of our rights somewhat confusing. And whenever you talk about rights, particularly in this setting, when you're working with people who have a disability and who are in some ways vulnerable, this is the question that always comes up. Does that mean he or she has the right to <laughs> and you can fill in the blank, right? To eat sugar when they're diabetic, to smoke cigarettes when it's bad for them, to drink to excess and fall down and hurt themselves, to sleep with whom they want, even if we think it's irresponsible or dangerous. So that's where we get away from talking about these great things that we can all agree on, these universal rights, to individual expression of those rights. And that's where we get answers, we get questions like this. Does that mean she has the right to? And we begin negotiating. Well, let me tell you something, rights that get negotiated away are never yours in the first place. If you have the right to freedom of assembly, but when the G20 comes to town, it's taken away, you didn't have that right to begin with. If you have the right to water, if you want to walk four kilometers to the, to the well, because we own this one. And you never had that right in the first place, did you? So any right that gets negotiated away was never an honored or respected or actualized right in the first place. If you have a right, it has to be there when you want to exercise it. If you have it and it's always gone when you want to use it, you never had it. So when I hear, does he or she have the right to, and then I hear an agency like CLT or some other agency say, 
Well, technically, yes, but realistically, <laughs> no. We don't, we don't have the resources for that, are we? We're, the, the structure of the system isn't made for that. You have to understand the greater good for the most takes precedent over what's right for the individual. And after all, if they don't like it, they can. So rights that are negotiated away, whether it's the freedom of assembly, or freedom of religion, or freedom to water, or, or the right to make choices in your own life, if it's negotiated away by a government or an agency, it was never honored in the first place. Rights have to be recognized and honored and respected before they exist. So obviously we know that you have to fight for your rights, and after you get them, you have to fight to protect them, right? Because there's always somebody there to claw it back, to say, well, technically, yes, but realistically, no. So rights need protections. And certain people need protections in their rights. The easiest way to protect your rights is to be privileged. You ever notice people with millions of dollars don't worry too much about what they have the right to? Because they can buy whatever they want. They can buy access to justice, they can buy access to affordable housing. They don't like where they are, they can leave. Rights are protected by privilege. In a heterosexual normative world, none of you had to fight for the right to live with, love, and marry the person that you wanted to live with and love and marry. I did. Because my rights weren't respected because I didn't have the privilege of being normal or typical. It wasn't long ago when I was considered mentally ill. Okay. Only the 70s. Mentally ill. Unfit to be a police officer, unfit to work in the government, unfit to work with children, unfit to work in hospitals or with vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. You have to fight for your rights and then you have to protect them, especially if they're not protected by privilege of being part of the main group the inside crowd. If you're one of the outsiders, if you're one of the left out, if you're one of the excluded, if you're one of the marginalized, you better be prepared to fight for your rights and then fight to protect them because you don't have the privilege. They're not just going to be given to you. They're not assumed to be So marginalized people need enhanced protections for the erosion of their rights. What do you think, and this is really why we're here today, all of this before this was just a grandiose setup for this question. What are the areas of rights protection that differ from us to the people that we work with? What do you have the right to? Because if your intellectual privilege would never be questioned, that for them has to be protected, and protected by you and them, and their families, and their advocates, and their governments. What? Sorry? The ability to make decisions. Bad decisions. <laughs> you can screw up your life however you want. That's your business, right? I can make all the bad choices in the world. Other people have to because they're not part of the in crowd. They're not part of the privilege. They're not part of the powerful. They have to have the right to make mistakes protected. This is one I think that people need protection. Individuality and personal expression, and I think that's what you're talking about. You have the right to be any individual you want to be. You have the right to create a life. You know, you're born, you're brought into this world, your parents do the best they can, usually, sometimes not. And then what happens? Then you're on your own, baby, and you go out there and you gotta do it. And you do that based on who you want to be, whether you want to be an artist, or, or a lawyer, or, or a house painter, or a bum. Well, I don't know what that is. Individuality and personal expression, control. We have the right, is protected by our privilege, to control our destinies. Those are, those are given to us, or honored by us, because of our privilege. Because we have an intellect that says, we don't have the right to take his control away from him to live his life. If you don't have that intellect, then suddenly that right is vulnerable. Personal connection. I'm going to pick on you because I'm not the what is your what what, do, what is your voice mean to you? What does your family mean to you? Everything. 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 My family means everything to me. I have absolutely no reason to live if I wasn't in love with the people that love me and have a, a, a significant and important and viable, realistic, loving relationship with them. Without that, I I get nothing. 
I would suggest the same as a, true for everyone on, on some level. Even if you have money, even if you have power, even if you have privilege, at the end of the day, it is the quality of your relationships, it is the respect that you're given and that you give, it is the love that you have and the love that you take and the love that you make, quote the Beatles, um, that makes life worth living. Safe and affordable housing. I work with individuals who um, live in the community independently. They don't have family. They live on $1,100 a month. Most of them pay six, fifty, seven hundred for an apartment. Oh, what money? Or if they're in Toronto Community Housing Corporation, they live next to people using drugs and abusing drugs, people selling their body. They live with bed bugs and cockroaches. They live next to people who have take one look at them and go, I know I can take your check. I know when it's coming, I'm going to follow you to the bank. I work with people who are so often alone and desperate and isolated and lonely from a life of being excluded and marginalized and penalized that they'll do anything for a friendship. So when one of John's guys says uh, is living in Trump Beauty Housing Corporation and another one says to him, hey, listen, man, uh, take this package down the street for me, will you? Who do you think ends up in jail? We need safe and affordable housing for people who have been marginalized and don't have the privilege to protect themselves. <coughs> Patriarchal abuse. This photo just... Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know that 80-some percent of all women with an intellectual disability have been sexually violated, exploited, abused, or raped in their life? Do you know that that same statistic goes for men and in four times what is the average for a typical man? Four times. It's in the 40s. People have the right not to be abused by patriarchal authority. What, what is patriarchal abuse? Does anybody know how to define that? I define patriarchal abuse as any time anybody says, I know better than you what's for you. And that can be done by a woman. It can be done by a man. It can be done by anybody. As soon as I say, I know better than you what's best for you, that's a form of abuse of power. Patriarchal abuse. This is one of my favorites. Everybody has the right to be free from patronizing disempowerment. I just want to say it right now. Screw pity. Just forget it, man. I'm so sick of pity. Oh, you poor thing. You poor dear. Oh, that's... Oh, let me help you. What we do to people when we do that is we disempower them. We take away all their autonomy. We set up a power paradigm that I'm feeling kind of like right now because I'm up here and you, everybody else is down there, which I'm not too comfortable with. But that's what we do when we pity someone. We take away their autonomy. We take away their ability to, to really be their best selves. What? The right to privacy. What? This is a, a photo from an old institution. I think you, you guys remember how this used to go. Oh, okay. Certainly does. He worked in them. I worked in the institution. This picture was taken. Everybody was lined up, hauled into the washroom. Where the bathrooms. In this country, we have a very, very um, difficult past in how we have treated people who we thought were different from us because of a few IQ points here and there. Everybody has the right to privacy. This kind of thing still goes on in some of our institutions and in some of our group homes and in some of our day programs and some of our, our homes that uh, you know, people live in, old folks' homes. We just we saw in the paper this week about some of the difficulties the uh, nursing homes are having here, the kind of abuse that's going on. Anytime you have an institutional mindset that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use patriarchal abuse, which is, I know better than you what's best for you, Anytime you have that, you are going to have a violation of rights on many, many, many levels on many fronts. And the right to privacy is just, just one of those and just the, the institutionalization. Can you see that picture? It's not an old picture. The picture is two years old. It was taken by um, someone in Peru one of the uh, institutions there, that man has now been freed from that situation because of disability rights uh, activists. 
what we do, what you can do, this grand meme of human rights, does make a difference. Never believed it, it doesn't. This is one of my favorites too. I have both. Do the people that we work with have the right to accommodation and support from those that work with them who have expertise? Do some of the people in this room that are the reason you have a house and are employed and have benefits, do they have the right to expect you to be good at your job? Do they have the right to expect you to stay current and be an expert and to have expertise? I would argue absolutely. I demand that from my doctor. I demand it from my financial planner. Hell, I demand it from my plumber. I want the professionals who, who work in my life to have expertise, to stay current in their field, and to come to work, when they come to work for me, at the top of their game, and bring their very best to their job every single day. Because you know, we're not building cars here, people. It's too important. If you can't, if you can't be, if you're not up for the job and you don't want to be up for the job, stay home and get another job. Do you okay? Do it all right I did. I did. I did. Um, and I say that to I myself hear. first, okay? okay. I'm absolutely my, I'm the first one on that. I hear. Do we have the right to our own interpretation of reality? I guarantee you that John does not see the world in the same way that I see the world. Because John is a very tall, handsome black man. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm a little white gay guy. We see the world, we experience the world, and the world experiences us very, very differently. Believe me, I, you know, people sit next to me on the subway, it's okay. Just a couple of days ago, a woman wouldn't sit next to John. She asked people to, some young people to move, because she didn't want to sit near a black man. So I guarantee you that my experience of the world, and the world's experience of me, is very different than the world's experience of every one of you. And some of the people sitting in this room have another very, very different experience of and from the world. They are not welcomed in the way that we all hope are in many, many situations. So do we have the right to interpret the world in our own way? I worked with a, with a young man um, a number of years ago. He ended up being one of my favorite people in the whole world. And when he would get on the subway, when we would go out on the subway together, um, he, he did a lot of self-talk and that sort of thing. And people would stare at him, and sometimes people would laugh at him, quite frankly. And this always bothered me, and I always wondered how this individual felt about that, and, and how he dealt with that. And I said to him one day, you know what, because we, we knew each other quite well, I said, did you, John, do you notice that, that people will stare at you? And he said, oh, yes, and he was just thrilled, you know. I said, well, why do you think they do that? And he said, they love me because I'm a good boy. <laughs> John had a right to interpret his experience in a way that was best for him to interpret it. Who has heard of the, the, the Mad Pride movement? Anybody heard of Mad Pride? Yeah. It's, it's a movement of people who have experienced um, some mental health issues and gotten involved in the, in the mental health system, or system as I like to call it. Um, and they, they call themselves consumer survivors because they have consumed you know, part of the system and they have survived the system that was there to help them. And they have survived sometimes mental health problems or mental health problems. They call themselves mental health or consumers, survivors. Um, and they've started a movement called um, the Mad Pride Movement. And what they're saying is basically, I have the right to see the world the way that I want to see it. And you, you're going to label me with something like, um, like uh, say, manic depression or, or bipolar. You know, because sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down. But you know what? I like my ups. When I'm up, I'm creative, and I'm excited, and I enjoy things. I, I really live life to the fullest, and I'm energetic. And yeah, I pay for that later with some depression and some downs, but I'm willing to take that trade off because that's who I am. And I don't want your medication that flattens me out all the time, that makes me put on 30 pounds, gives me tardive dyskinesia, and I sleep all day. That's not me. I don't recognize that person. And I see the world differently. And I have the right to interpret the world the way I want to interpret the world. And I have the right to control my body, what goes in it, and how I live. 
So that's the mad pride movement. And I wonder sometimes if in our jobs, we consistently deny people the right to interpret the world the way that they want to interpret it. And to interact with it the way they want to. Do we have the right not to reach our potential? Did anybody else have this mother? I would bring home a B plus and she'd say, an A so hard? You were so close. What could you do next time? You could be A. You had that mother. I can, I can tell you. Or you are that mother, baby. I don't, I don't want to say. Do we have it? Do we have the right not to reach our potential? This is something I think is really important for us in this field because in the developmental se sector services, we're constantly asking people to do more, to be better, to improve, to do, you know, but you could do so much better, but you could, we're always pushing people to be more than what they are instead of just letting people be who they are and, and how they are. I have the right not to reach my potential. I Maybe some people think I could do better than talking to you. I happen to like that, so I'm happy with where I am. We all have the right to our own personal standards of excellence. Yeah. <laughs> Can you read this? Can you see what this says? I have had this mustard on my shirt for three days. <laughs> I cleaned up to come and talk to you today, but normally I am a horrific slob. I don't own clothes that didn't come from Goodwill. John's a very snappy dresser, I don't know. An artistic figure. Thank you. See, the stereotype. My house is a mess. It's just destroyed. I have the right to keep my messy house. Because I have the right to have my own personal standards of excellence. And so does everybody in this room. Rights without responsibilities create entitlement. So everybody who's a big Will and Kate fan, is that her name, Kate? Yeah, thank you. Oh, we've got a fan. <laughs> I apologize for this, but I couldn't think of another person who better really represented having rights without responsibilities. Because after all, this young man, just by virtue of being born, is the king of an empire. Just by virtue of being born. It's quite a birthright, isn't it? Some of the other people in this room, myself included, received a very different birthright when we were born. So rights without responsibilities equal entitlement. I think we know what entitlement means. We hear people, I'm entitled to this. They claim to things that they didn't work for. So we're going to talk about that because every time you talk about rights, somebody says, yeah, but you're going to have responsibilities. Right? There's always that type A personality in the room who looks at the other side, and that's fair enough. Good. That's a, that they are two sides at the same point. And what happens when you have rights with responsibility is you end up with empowerment. As opposed to entitlement, you have empowerment. So let's talk about this. The empowerment is a sort of a we can do it kind of attitude, right? That leads to success. Go ahead. So we have a bit of a pyramid. First, we honor people's rights. Then next, we expect them to be responsible in the execution of those rights. And what happens after they demonstrate that is they become empowered. They become masters of their own destiny. They become adept at making their own decisions, taking risks, living with the consequences of their decisions. That's part of taking responsibility. That's what responsibility is. Responsibility is living with the consequences of exercising your rights. And in the end, we end up with respect. When someone has their rights honored, they act responsibly, they become empowered, they're easier to respect, and they receive respect naturally. And then what happens is this. This is so fancy, I love this. Yay, it works. <laughs> this becomes cyclical. The more respect a person has, the more rights of theirs that are honored. The more responsibilities they're given, they're more empowered, and then they receive more respect. And it just keeps going like that. It just keeps building in an upward spiral. One of the things I want us to be aware of when we're talking about rights is, when you're working with someone in this context, this is your working life. This is what you do from, how, yeah. what are your hours work? 
So this is what you do 7.5 hours a day, right? This is your working life. At the end of it, you go home. This is other people's lives. They don't take a vacation from their life. They don't go home at the end of the day away from their situation. They stay in that situation. They live in it. This is our working life. This is their life. Sometimes what we, what we like to do in our working life is we like to make things um, sort of the same. Right? We, we like routine in our working life. I go, in, I go to Timmy's, I get my coffee, I sit at my desk, I turn on the computer, spend 10 minutes, I get organized. That routine is important for us in our working life. It makes us feel like we're in control. Is routine what we want in our personal lives? I like a little spontaneity every once in a while. I, you know, I like to roll with the punches, make decisions, you know, do something different, right? Brings enthusiasm and excitement to your life. We need to remember that when we're working with the people that we work with, this is their life. It may be your work day, but it's their life. And so this, this judge is saying, in an attempt to speed up our backlog of ways, we just computerize the scales of justice. <laughs> I think we do that sometimes. I know I'm guilty of doing that when I say to people, I know this, I'm going to trample on your rights here, but it's really convenient for me at work to do that. The system will work a lot better if I just ignore your rights and do what I need to do to make the system work. We put the system before people. And here's why we do it, people. This is, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end for those of you who are, are really tiring of the sound of my voice. You see, what happens is, the government has an agenda, and they create social control mechanisms. Social control mechanisms are schools, prisons, agencies. This is the way the government controls what happens in society. And they have an agenda, and their agenda is usually a corporate agenda, as a matter of fact, to keep you consuming, keep you buying. So what they do then is they fund various agencies, and those agencies write things called core competencies. We've heard a lot about core competencies in this agency lately, haven't we? Let me ask you a question. If you were an RCMP officer in 1952 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and you went to your sergeant or supervisor and you said, I would like a, um, some money, a grant, because I, I think we need more Aboriginal people, aka people, in the RCMP. <laughs> How much money do you think you're going to get from... Not a dime. Not a dime. Not a dime. You know why? They tell you, well, you're not really acting on the core competencies of your... You don't really understand your job here. Your job as an officer is to control the Aboriginal people. Of to get rid of those deviants not promote them into the service. So the government has an agenda, they have social control mechanisms, they fund agencies, they say that you have poor competencies, but they've forgotten one thing. This great country and in every great democracy on the planet, they forgot one thing. If we do socially progressive advocacy by getting off our butts and voting, to getting out there and fighting for people's rights, to being activists and involved and advocates for human rights, guess what? We can change the government agenda. Because this is a democracy and we have the power. We can change the government agenda. The government agenda in Canada has been changed a number of times, which is now why, if you go to Winnipeg in the RCMD and you ask for a grant to help Aboriginal people and gay and lesbian people join the force, guess what? You're probably going to get a grant, aren't you? Because we said, no, this is unjust. This is not right. And we stood up for human rights. And we changed the government agenda. So we changed the way social control mechanisms work. We changed who gets funding. And we changed the four competencies, the things that say, you're doing a good job. I suggest to you that we can do that within Community Living Toronto. We can do that within this city. We can do that within this province. We can do it within this country. And we can do it on a global scale as citizens of the, of the world. I guess at the end of the day, what I'm asking for is for you to be advocates and activists and be willing to pay the price for that. And we know that there is a price to be paid for that. So here's the takeaway.